Welcome and thanks for coming to our program tonight. My name is uh, Craig Hadley, I'm the director here at the Denos Museum Center. Uh, I've had the great pleasure of knowing Natalie uh, since 2013 when we first started planning an exhibit of her work uh, at the previous museum I worked at uh, at DePaul University. She holds an MFA in sculpture from the Massachusetts College of Arts and she most recently participated in a residency at the UCross Foundation in Sheridan, Wyoming uh, just last year. She's also completed a number of new commissions and I know she's, she's busy finishing a few more up uh, even this year. And she also launched a separate retail operation within the last few years called Spiders and Birds, aptly named for and quote, two greatest, the two greatest engineers and weavers on our planet. Natalie also participated in a TEDx program way back in 2011 named Art Made of Storms. Uh, and that's actually how I first learned about her work through a colleague of mine who saw the TEDx film and then uh, told me about Natalie's work. So her current exhibit at the Denos is entitled Stay Healthy and Strong. And it quote, explores the human response related to extreme weather patterns and the COVID-19 pandemic through tra translation of scientific data into woven sculptures, installation, and musical score. This exhibit includes works focused on COVID-19 data and natural disasters that have taken place during the pandemic. So again, thanks everyone for joining us and let's welcome Natalie uh, back to Traverse City. You were here earlier with us for the installation. Um, have you recovered from the what was it, four or five day marathon installation that we had? <laughs> yeah, uh, thank you. Thanks. Thank you all for all of you for coming tonight. Uh, it is really wonderful to be back. And yes, I actually want to start by thanking the Denos Museum staff, uh, because this was a very labor intensive four day install. And I couldn't have done this without the help of everyone who pitched in. So Thank you to all of you for making this exhibit possible. That's because I wouldn't have never gotten it done in time. Um, they are very labor intensive. Uh, it's part of what I love about them because you really, uh, because they are about, um, you know, making the pieces work in the space that they're being exhibited in. You really have to, you can't just put it on the wall. You have to really think about the space and you're in the space and you just, it's, it's just really nice. I like the fact that it is so labor intensive. I guess that's part of it. I, I was going to say so much of every installation too, for you in particular, is dependent on the site and the, the space that's available and the way that a work like uh, Madness of a Drowning Gambler behind me uh, fills that particular space. And it, it won't look the same in another gallery, um, certainly. Yeah, that's that's very true. And that's also, in a sense, uh, they're built to be able to to breathe because I don't have that kind of wall in my studio. This is my studio here in Boston. You know, my biggest wall is uh, maybe 12 feet. So everything I have to build, I build in a very dense matter that then can breathe and expand. So even though I've, I make pieces that are 30 feet, I've made a 50 foot wall piece they all have this very concentrated center that can then breathe. So it allows me to leave the work flexible and adjust to the space. So, yes. And then also, I think it's an opportunity to, you know, rediscover the piece every time, because one thing that's interesting about these pieces, they are about natural disasters and the, and um, we, you know, they, uh, when a disaster happens, let's say like Hurricane Katrina, when it happened, people were understanding that disaster in, in, in a certain way. But now that we've had all these other disasters afterwards, the, you know, the story of Katrina gets recontextualized. So showing these pieces in other spaces and later on is also a way of revisiting those stories or revisiting those disasters and giving me a chance to um, sometimes actually change the piece and add something to the piece that maybe brings it to the present or brings in aspects of a disaster that just recently happened that you know connects to the to the original story of Hurricane Katrina, for example. Well, and so and so many of your works really do um, connect in some capacity back to water. And so I know many of your earlier works when we were working together back in uh, 2013, 2015, um, lots of references to 
uh, historical shipwrecks to uh, ice storms, um, you know, hurricanes and flooding. Can you talk a little bit about um, maybe natural disaster and some of that material as sort of the primary source material for the works that you create? Um, and just maybe your general interest in, in the subject. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's not a coincidence that there, especially in the earlier, earlier pieces, there was a lot of water reference because I started to look at weather um, while I was in residence at, in uh, staying at, at Cape Cod and Cape Cod is this peninsula that juts out into the ocean, into, into the Atlantic Ocean in uh, Southeast Massachusetts. And to really understand the weather in New England, you have to also look at the ocean. So it's your, when you're looking at weather, you're also looking at ocean systems. So this idea of, of water and air and, and weather systems and ocean systems being interconnected is something that uh, was part of my studio practice or studio lens, I, I guess, from the very beginning. And I started, I started to focus on weather because uh, prior to working with weather, I had been looking at astronomy, which is sort of how I got into data translation and basket weaving. So the original pieces I made were looking at astronomy and using basket weaving as a way of trying to address questions I had about astronomy through some sort of tactile medium. And basket weaving happened to be what I, what I did at the time. But uh, I really wanted to understand what happens when I'm the one who actually collects the data uh, rather than having, you know, rather than getting the data from the internet or from, from a scientist who has, who has collected it um, through, through their research. So weather is something that's very easily collectible. You can, you know, everybody can collect weather. It's very easy to measure. Um, and so when I was on, living on Cape Cod for two years uh, at an artist residency, I was doing the uh, fine, arts, fine arts work center residency there weather sort of became the natural laboratory through which to investigate what data is and how I can use data, not only to build sculptures with, but to understand this complex system of weather. And at the beginning, I would say it was very much about trying to understand the scientific narrative of weather, trying to understand it as this very complex system that is interacting with the environment. So the pieces began in a very didactic manner. They began with the question that, that was sort of inspired by the data I was collecting, and then it would go and make a sculpture to address that. So for example, the piece that's behind me, that kind of warpy thing that you see, mm -hmm. that's one of those very early pieces where I was looking at the relationship between barometric pressure and bird sightings as I was um, uh, uh, as I was collecting data on Cape Cod. So that sort of originated from that question. But over time, I became more interested in how humans respond to weather and how we understand it, uh, not just in a day-to-day -day, uh, way, because we are very, you know, we, it's, we understand weather in a very holistic way. Uh, a, a weather instrument is a, is a metronome. It can measure something very good, very well, but it can only measure one thing. So temperature or wind or pressure. But when we're interacting with weather, we're interacting with all of our senses and we observe so much about our weather, uh, about the weather that, that, uh, that we, that we live with. So then there's that side, but then there's also the other side, which is how do we respond to extreme weather events? Um, and that's sort of where the work shifted. And the work became not just looking at the scientific story of weather, but exploring a little bit more our idiosyncratic responses to weather, especially in the, in, in the context of climate change. And so the work changed, it became more metaphor driven and I guess the piece behind you is a perfect example of that. There's a, even though it is filled with data, there's also lots and lots of other sculptural components that you might not associate with data, such as the horses or the carousel or the woven mats. Um, so that's sort of, that's an example of how the work changed from a very didactic manner like that piece, which is really, this is like a 3D graph of, of data, this piece behind me. Well, the piece behind Craig is very much trying to tell a story about, or trying to take a, lar a, 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 a larger, a, a kind of, a, a, trying to take a look at how we are responding to weather um, and making room for these more complicated responses that we have. 
So this is this piece is called The Madness of a Drowning Gambler. And it's a piece that I made for a show in Houston. So I was invited to do a show at the Houston Center for Contemporary Craft. And I was doing the show um, two years after Hurricane Harvey. And so 2019 was the show, 2017 was, was the storm. And I knew that I wanted to make pieces that didn't explain Harvey because every person who was going through this exhibition had experienced the storm and I hadn't. So I wanted to be careful about what kind of narrative I was building with the data. And, and so instead I, was, I made a lot of pieces that looked at, that tried to kind of take a step back and look at other causes of flooding that have um, impacted the area for years. Uh, so Hurricane Harvey was a particular bad storm, but Houston has had to deal with flooding for many, many years. And some of the causes of that flooding are climate change, but there are also other reasons such as, you know, bad building policies, um, politics, uh, you know, all sorts of other things that have, that have enabled um, flooding conditions to worsen. And so this piece is about Houston and the Gulf Coast area south of Houston. And it is talking about flooding events that have impacted that area. But it's really, but this piece really could have been made uh, about any piece, uh, any any city that is dealing with with flooding, because it's trying to it's trying to look at this dilemma, this existential dilemma that we're at, where we're both, in a sense, the cause of a lot of this this um, a lot of these disasters by the fact that we are we are um, contributing to climate change and making it worse, but at the same time, we're also the victim of, of, of the causes of climate change. So sort of this duality of being the perpetrator and the victim of this at the same time. And how does that play itself out when we actually uh, live through or experience a um, hurricane? So the piece begins, it's a sort of, it, it, has, a, it has a flow. It, it goes from right to left. And it begins with this carousel that you see that's standing on a little shelf where this water sort of drooping down. And this, this carousel is made up of data of three storms that really frame the conversation of hurricane disaster and relief in 2017. So we're looking at Hurricane Irma, Hurricane Harvey and Hurricane Maria. And so the, the carousel is basically a data visualizations of all of these storms together. And it's also a carousel with horses and that's not a coincidence, that's not, not uh, random. It is also a reference to Jane's carousel, which was a, a carousel that um, was flooded during Hurricane Sandy in Brooklyn. So it was a carousel that was right by the Brooklyn Bridge and, and it had all those horses that were slowly sort of being drowned by the water. So this, this carousel and this piece is made up of this data of these three storms that are sort of, and I think of it as sort of this engine that's going crazy and wild and it's churning and churning and the horses come loose from that, her, from that carousel. And they enter these, this, these little, these waves that are part of a game um, called horse racing that you would oftentimes find in um, amusement parks or in fairs. And, and so that whole panel is filled with games of chance so dominoes and those 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 horse racing and however those horses and so, so so it's kind of the the reference here is you know we are sort of we are gambling with our future because we don't really know how to respond to climate change we're doing it but not really in a way that we should in order to really be able to um, prevent any long-term uh, changes to to the planet so we're gambling and the horses in these games get unmoored and they and they run amok and they run into the second panel, which is the middle, into this dense area of overlapping papers. And these overlapping papers, which you can't really see from afar, but they're based there. The, this, this, the middle panel is all about hurricane, is all about Houston. And um, the, the, it's made up of these cutout pieces of paper that have that have neighborhoods that are flooded by that have been flooded uh, during Harvey. So there are sections of the Houston area uh, where you can, you know, that have been flooded and how 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 many feet of water they had and so forth. And then uh, these larger panels 
that look like little that, that have little squares like white squares and brown squares and um, some red squares those are uh, that those translate um, precipitation events of five major uh, flooding events that have impacted Houston and that continue to be, to be sort of the, the the flooding events that everybody measures any kind of storm by uh, when it hits Houston. Um, and so these horses kind of run amok into this wall and and they and when they do that they sort of they push everything to the to the left side and then the horses run through that wall of of cutouts and they run to the third panel, which is a woven map of the golf course south, Gulf Coast south of Houston. So those uh, the, the the coiled uh, pieces that are orange colored are, are actually the water, the Gulf, the the um, the waters of the Gulf of Mexico, and then the 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 blues that are sort of on the outskirts of that orange um, woven mat are actually land areas that are right now continuously flooded because of sea level rise. So it's sort of trying to also now look at sea level rise and and looking at how sea level rise has impacted flooding in that part of, of the state. And emanating from this map are these rafts, these tiny rafts where you see houses and you see kind of blocks that might you know reference skyscrapers. And it's sort of asking the question, well, what are these what are cities, what are our communities going to look like in the future if, you know, more and more our coastal areas are going to be flooded uh, because of sea level rise? So how can we reimagine our lives uh, with, with this changing coastal line and with this changing environment, not just flooding on the coast, but also increased flooding in the city itself? So it's, uh, it's not, you know, it's definitely trying to um, pose some larger questions about how what is our role in, in, in this, and, or not just what is our role, but, but recognizing this sort of um, dilemma that we're in where we're both suffering the consequences of these extreme weather patterns that are in part caused by our own, by our own uh, way of living on this planet. Um, and so it's this, you know, being the perpetrator as well as being the victim kind of thing. Um, 